today um, we're going to be talking about another holy habit. Now, again, the, the habits that we're talking about, they're different from the spiritual disciplines that as followers of Christ, we should have in our everyday life. These are kind of other habits in, in life that we as, as Christians, as believers, can redeem uh, for God's honor and for God's glory. We can redeem these for the holy purpose of leading people to follow Christ in a life-changing way. Way. And so that's kind of our, our goal throughout this series. Now, today's habits may not seem as spiritual as some of the other habits that we have talked about. Um, kind of on the surface, as I, as I say it, and as we kind of start diving into this, it may not seem as spiritual as the holy habit of confession or the holy habit of humility. But I'm going to argue today that this particular habit is a very spiritual habit. It is very spiritual. And I say that for two reasons. Number one, if you engage in this habit, and I'm not talking about like once a month or every now and then, but if you make this habit like a part of your everyday life, two things are going to happen. The first thing is your life is going to be transformed your life is going to be transformed. Even after you have become a Christian and, and Christ changes us from the inside out, uh, when we engage in this habit, it's like our, our walk with Christ begins to go to another level. So your life will be changed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of dare you with that. I'm gonna tease you with that. If you wanna change your life, this will be the habit that will make a great impact. The second thing that makes this a spiritual habit is it points other people to Jesus. If you engage, if you participate in this habit on a regular, consistent, daily basis, I will promise you that other people will see it and they'll be attracted to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so because it transforms our life, because it points other people to Jesus, I'm going to argue this is the spiritual holy habit of having fun. Having fun. Now, you, go, you just go ahead and smile. Just turn your neighbor and, and just smile for a second, all right? So when we say having fun, what we're talking about, we're talking about smiling, we're talking about enjoying life. We're talking about going to work with a, uh, with a spirit of, of joy about you. We're, we're talking about um, just enjoying the, the small things and, and just, just downright having fun. Now, I, I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm going to kind of give the, um, the kind of the other side of this. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of good people. There's a lot of well-meaning, even believers who actually believe that as Christians, we should not have any fun, that we should have a, a frown on our face, that we should be serious all of the time, and that anything fun is, is sin, that if, that if you enjoy doing it, there's a, there's a group of people that, that, that think this way, this is a, a belief, that, that if you actually enjoy it, that, that it's not from God. Now, there's another group of people, uh, people who, who reject Christ, and they'll even say, I don't want to become a Christian because I won't be able to have any fun. Maybe, maybe you've thought that before you became a follower of Christ. Maybe you've heard somebody in your family or somebody that you work with say that, like, man, I, I just, I can't, I can't follow Christ. I can't submit myself to God's commands because that just doesn't sound like any fun, both of those circumstances, both of those ideas of thinking could not be further from the truth. Can I tell you something today? Let me kind of give you the, the bottom line. Let's, let's kind of, if you're taking notes, this might be something you, you want to write down. As followers of Christ, our fun is not restricted by God's commands. Having fun is actually released by God's commands. See, I believe that as a, that as a Christian, as a, as a believer, we don't have less fun, we have more fun. And everybody said amen. amen. Right? Are you just making sure you're with me, right? Making sure I haven't lost you yet. I believe we have the opportunity to actually have more fun than any other person on the face 
of the planet because we have been saved by the grace of God. That's, we have reason to have fun. Think about it. Nobody else has reason to have fun other than to have fun. But as a, as a believer, as a, as a guy, as a, as a person that's been saved, that's been removed out of the penalty of hell and sin and death and, and been gifted the gift of eternal life, we have reason to have fun. So, and you, you, know, you might be thinking, well, Andy, it, it, you know, where is it commanded in the Bible that, that we should have fun? Uh, hey, I give it to you. That's a good one. Um, it does not say, thou shalt have fun. It doesn't, you're, you're not going to find that. But you know what else you're not going to find? You're not going to find a, a passage that says, thou shalt not have fun. You're not going to find that. It's not in there, right? But as you look throughout Scripture, and this is why we're going to kind of be all over the place, you're going to, you're going to find lots of different things that says that, that, that we, as, as a people of God, as a child of God, we're to have a, an unspeakable, overwhelming, and overflowing joy in our life. I can't even say it without smiling. We're, we're to have that kind of joy. So, do you know why God gives us the Ten Commands? Do you know why he gives us these commandments? Not just the Ten Commandments, but all these instructions on, on how to live. I know why. You know how I know? Because God tells us in Deuteronomy 5. I don't want you to think that I'm just kind of making this up. This isn't Andy's thoughts or, or ideas. This is, this is straight from, from God's mouth. This is from his word. In Deuteronomy 5, we see a list of the Ten Commandments. And notice how um, God kind of summarizes at the end. He gives the reason why. Um, Deuteronomy 5, verse 33, he says, You shall walk in all the way which the Lord your God has commanded you. In other ways, another, another way to say it is, you should keep all the commandments. Like everything that I've, that I've told you, everything that I have instructed you, you should walk in that. And then he goes on to say that, and when you, when you see the word that, it's like here's, here's the reason or, or because. He says, um, you should obey all that I have commanded you so that you'll live a boring life. It doesn't say that, does it? At least not in my version. I hope not in yours. If it's in your version, throw that Bible away, all right? It's not what it says. It says, I've given you all these things that you may live and then it may be well with you. Can you say well to your neighbor? Just turn to your neighbor and say well. You know, we want to come back to that word in just a second. That it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days in the land which you will possess. Here's what God is saying. If you walk according to my instructions, it'll be well with you. In other words, it'll be pleasing to you is what the word means. It'll put a smile on your face when you walk in such a way that is pleasing to God. See, sometimes we think, and this is true, that if I do what God says, it makes him happy. It pleases God. It puts a smile on his face. But what God tells us is, when you do what I say, it puts a smile on your face. It is pleasing to you. It is a benefit. It is, a, it is good. It puts joy in our hearts when we live according to God's word. So listen, God's commands don't restrict our fun. It actually releases us as followers of Christ to have the most fun. But here's the thing. It is impossible because of our sin nature. You're a sinner. If anyone hasn't told you today, all right? Hey, I'm a sinner. You can tell me, Andy, you're a sinner. Oh, no one, all right, someone's got to say it. Uh, thank you, thank you. Don't, don't enjoy it too much as you say it, all right? So we're all sinners. What that means is we cannot completely fulfill the commands of God. We can't. We can't do it. So what does is, what is Jesus come along to do? Jesus comes along to fulfill what we cannot do. And in John 10, this is the other verse of Scripture we want to look at. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus gives us the reason why he came. He said, I came so that you can have life and have it abundantly. The word abundantly means to the fullest. Jesus came to do what we could not do on our own so that we could experience the fullness of the life that God has in store for us. Listen, having fun 
is a spiritual habit. In fact, I would even take it a step further today to, to say that if you're a believer, it's not just your right to have fun, it's your responsibility to have fun. For the sake of you living in the joy of Christ, for the sake of the Holy Spirit shining through you, and for the sake of the world around us, it is our responsibility to have fun, to enjoy life. Now, um, in the scripture, 192 times you will find this word rejoice. And many times, not all the time, but many times this is in command form, meaning it's not just a a suggestion that we should think about. It's actually a, an instruction that we should live by to rejoice, to be glad, to be happy, to wear a smile on our face. Let me show you a couple of verses that illustrate this. Um, and first off, in First Chronicles 16, verse 31, it says, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. You see what's going on here? In the heavens, they're glad because they're in the presence of God. But look, guess what? On this side of heaven, on earth, we don't get to miss out on rejoicing. In fact, it says, let the earth rejoice. That's you. That's us. Let us rejoice. And here's the reason. Because the Lord reigns. If you need a reason today to rejoice, if you kind of came in and, and you've got the scowl on your face and, and you're just kind of upset and, and you're angry about something, and listen, there's, there's time for those things, but if you need a reason to rejoice, then know the day that God is on his throne. And there's nothing that will ever change that. That, that causes us to rejoice, to know the one that we serve is sitting on his throne. There's another verse in Psalm 35, verse 9. David is writing. He says, My soul shall rejoice in the Lord. It shall exult in his salvation. You need a reason to rejoice? Rejoice in his salvation. Rejoice in the fact that you have re been redeemed. You have been purchased. The penalty for sin in your life has been paid for. There is reason for us to rejoice. As we continue on looking at Scripture in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6, verse 14, it says, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. You cannot dance and not enjoy it. Now, I'm going to tell you something. For those of you that can't dance, I can't dance. I do not like dancing. I did not go to dances, you know, growing up. Um, just, just not my thing. But every now and then, when you, you, you kind of dance a little bit, you just can't help but laugh. Whether it's with the girls in the living room just doing something silly, or this past Thursday, um, every Thursday at lunch, I have the, the privilege of going to, to Brookwood and Georgetown, the new satellite campus here. And uh, <laughs> Billy's already smiling because he witnessed it. They were listening to some music and uh, there was this one young lady, she was listening to this song, and she told the, the, the guy next to her, and, and Brookwood and Georgetown, they, they, uh, they provide work for adults with special needs, and so I get to have lunch, and it's always just a treat. Something happened Thursday, and, and she was like, get up and dance. So this, this other guy gets up and starts dancing, and she gets up and starts dancing with him, and this other guy comes along, and, and they're like, hey, Andy, come dance with us. And normally, like, my, my character, my, um, my instinct is, is saying, don't do it. <laughs> mm -mm. Somebody's always got a video camera, and that would be embarrassing. But I got up after Billy put his uh, cell phone away, and just for a few minutes, I just, I danced with these people. And I, and I can't dance, but it was so much fun. Listen, I don't know what kind of moves um, David was doing, if he was doing the, the Cupid shuffle or the whatever. But I think we see in this verse a guy who was rejoicing in the Lord. He was so overwhelmed in what God was doing in his life that it caused him to move and to dance before the Lord with all of his might. I read that and I see joy. I see a guy having fun. There's another verse of scripture and probably the most prominent, Philippians 4, verse 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Not every now and then, once a month, but always rejoice in the Lord. And just in case you missed it, I will say it again, rejoice. 
rejoice. That is our instructions that we are to live by. We are to be a joyful people. And this verse we don't have for you, but I was reminded of it this morning. So I was kind of giving thoughts to, to today. In Psalm 118, it says, This is the day the Lord has made. You know God made today? You know what it says our responsibility is? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I hope I'm making the case that we have a responsibility as Christians, as believers, as a saved people. We have a responsibility to have fun. We have a responsibility to display joy. So I want to tell you three things this morning, all right? I've not told you a lot already. It's kind of building up to this point or these three things. First thing I want to tell you is that Jesus had fun. Jesus had fun. Now, I don't know what, you know, when we, when, when, if I were to ask you to close your eyes right now and just kind of get a mental picture of Jesus, maybe you picture him on, on the cross. Maybe you picture him angry. He's got a scowl on his face, and he's kind of looking at you, trying to trap you every time you, every time you mess up. Maybe your picture of Jesus is just this, this tranquil, um, unassuming, quiet face. And that's all good. I think, I think Jesus had emotions. He was human. He went through all of that. But I wonder how many of us picture a Jesus who has the biggest smile on his face, who's grinning from ear to ear. And as you look upon the face of Jesus, you see this indescribable joy. Don't you know that Jesus had fun? Can I tell you five reasons why I believe that as we, as we talk about this? First off, um, Jesus attended uh, he socialized with people. He socialized with people. In Matthew 9, uh, verse 9 and 10, Jesus went from there. He saw a, a man named Matthew was sitting at the tax collector's booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up, and he, and he followed him. And here's what Jesus did. It happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. This is just one example, but we see throughout the life of Christ, in three years of ministry, multiple times, he's reclining at the table with people. What do you think he was doing there? You think he was just getting on to everybody? You think he had a scowl on his face? Or do you think he was enjoying the company? Do you think as he taught, he, he smiled and, and they laughed and, and, and cracked jokes? Listen, there's probably a lot that, that went on there, but just know that Jesus enjoyed socializing with people. He had moments where he got alone by himself in the quiet. He spent alone time with God. We need that. But you know what else we need? We need other people that we can come alongside and just smile together and just, and just do life together and just enjoy life together. I think we see that in, in the life of Christ. The second reason I know that Jesus had fun is Jesus spent time with kids. And you cannot spend time with kids and not have fun. You just can't. Unless it's just like you and 30 kids in a small little room, it may not be so much fun. But if you want to have fun, volunteer in Antioch Kids some Sunday. And listen, it's not all fun. But you know what is, I love it when we hear them, and, and sometimes they're concerned about it. Did we bother y'all? No, I wish you'd get louder. I wish we, you know, I, I, uh, excuse me. I saw research this week that said, the average child laughs 300 times per day. I've got 900 laughters in my house throughout, throughout a typical day. You know what it says for the adult? On average, 15 times per day. Hey, if you're at 15 times or less, you need to start hanging around some kids. Isn't that what Jesus did? In fact, there were people that were trying to bring kids to Jesus. You know what the, the disciples did? Hey, 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 stand back. Mm -mm. What did Jesus say? He says, no, 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 permit the children to come to me. It, Jesus was actually upset that they were keeping children away. Let them come to me for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Jesus spent time with kids. Jesus taught with illustrations. That's another reason I believe he had fun. Sometimes we read the scripture and we kind of read in our monotone. But don't you know that when Jesus gave illustrations that some of them are humorous? 
in their time, in their day. And I know in kind of Western culture, 2018, they go right over our head. But the one that comes to mind, when Jesus said, hey, you're worried about the speck in somebody else's eye, and there's a plank in your own eye. I believe, the scripture doesn't say this, but I'm, I so believe that that got a chuckle from people. <laughs> a plank in my eye. Yeah, imagine a two before just sticking out. That's funny. Jesus is using these illustrations, right, to communicate this deeper meaning because he is relating with people. I believe that Jesus had fun. Number four, he attended celebrations. What was the very first miracle that Jesus did? He turned water into wine. So here the, the party is about to be over. The celebration is about to end. Yes, it was going to be an embarrassment for the family, but Jesus could have said, no, 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 no more wine. Everybody get back to work. We got some, we got some serious business that they need to take care of. No, what, he said, he, he turned the water into wine. He wanted the, the celebration to continue. And here's the last reason I believe that Jesus had fun. Never once did Jesus criticize fun. He criticized hypocrisy. He was not afraid to criticize. He, he spoke boldly to the Pharisees, and he criticized legalism. He criticized not taking care of, of widows and orphans. He criticized when he walked into his father's house and saw how they were turning it into a marketplace. We see the righteous anger of God. We see him criticizing these things. But not once do you ever find Jesus criticizing people having fun. If he really did not want us to have fun, there, there would probably be some sort of precedent or some sort of example in Scripture of Jesus walking into a crowd saying, hey, guys, knock it off. All right, you're just having way too much fun. He never does that. So listen, I want you to know today, Jesus had fun. He experienced the joys of life. The second thing I want you to see this morning is this. You can have fun. I don't care how young you are, how old you are, how stiff you are, how serious you are, how dry you are, you can have fun. It's your responsibility as a follower of Christ to enjoy the life that he purchased for you. Two verses of scripture come to mind. One is when Jesus is kind of wrapping up his teaching to the disciples in John 15. He says something that I, that I just find so fascinating. He says, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you. Jesus had fun. Jesus experienced joy. And now as he gets ready to depart, he says, I've told you all these things so that my joy can be in you. He doesn't stop there. He says, so that your joy can be full. I've told you these things. What things is Jesus talking about? Well, you know, two ways we can interpret that. Maybe he was referring to everything he had ever told them, kind of all the commands and all the instructions and all the teaching. That's possible. I've told you everything so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. But more than likely, Jesus is talking about the thing that he had just said previous to that. What did he just say previous to that? He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who remains in me will bear much fruit. He's talking about how they, as he leaves, they need to remain in him. They need to stay connected to him. They need to abide in him because as we abide in Christ, we produce fruit. As we abide in Christ, his joy overflows into us and our joy overflows into the world around us. I told you these things so that my joy can be in you and so that your joy may be made full. Listen, you can have fun as you were made connected to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I believe that our joy metric is determined by how much time we spend with Jesus Christ. But listen, it's not just there. Did you know that joy is actually a fruit of the Spirit? Joy is not something that we receive as we remain in Christ. It's also something we receive as the Holy Spirit works through us. In Galatians 5, it lists these fruit of the Spirit. It says, for the fruit of the Spirit, or in other words, the evidence of the Spirit is love. You know what the second one is? Joy. Joy. 
It's a fruit of the Spirit. So listen, as we display joy, we are displaying the evidence of God's Spirit in our life. Having fun is a spiritual habit. We have a responsibility to display God's Spirit, to remain connected to Christ. So listen, Jesus had fun. You can have fun. Here's the most important thing. The world needs to see our joy. There are people you work with, there are neighbors around you that need desperately to see the joy in your life. Because in their life, there's no joy. There's a heaviness. There's burdens. There's weight. There's struggles. Listen, all that's in our lives as well. Even as a follower of Christ, you have all that. But when you put a smile on your face, when you live in such a way that displays joy, we, care, we are carrying out the commands of Paul who says that we are to consider it pure joy when we encounter trials of various kinds because the encountering of trials produces within us endurance. When we, 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 we encounter trials just like everybody else, but as a follower of Christ, that trial is producing something within us so we can, dis, we can consider that joy. We can obey the command when, that, um, that Paul told the Philippians that rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. The world desperately needs to see our joy. There's a young lady in our church. Um, she works with kids. And every time you see her, she's smiling. Not a fake smile, but a genuine, contagious, ear-to-ear smile. The story, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, is she started a, a new job this past year um, at a place here in Georgetown. And, and she doesn't just smile at church on Sunday in front of everybody and then go to work and say, all right, it's back to business. She smiles at work, and what happened is coworkers began to notice the joy in her life. And you know what people do when they notice the joy in, in your life? They start asking you questions. Why are you smiling all the time? Why is it that no matter what the pressures and the demands of our work is, you always have this, this, this positive outlook and this, this, this joyful response, people start asking questions. And when people start asking questions, we have the opportunity to start telling them about where the source of that joy comes from. It comes from remaining in Christ and displaying the Holy Spirit. We said throughout this Holy Habit series, each week we want to end with a, a challenge, a, a dare, um, a way to implement um, the, the habit that week. And so this week, I've, I've kind of got two things for you. One is, is a question I'm going to ask you to, to, to ask yourself. And the other thing is something to do. So first, the question is this. I want you to be honest and, and, and real with God about this question. What is keeping you from experiencing true joy in your life? What's keeping you? Listen, we, Jesus came so that we can have joy, and have it abundantly, so we can have an abundant life. He displayed joy for us. We remain connected to him. Like, it's a spiritual thing. So what is it that's keeping us from living out that joy? Maybe it's comparison. Maybe you compare your life to somebody else's life via Facebook and social media, and you see their best, and you see your worst, and it just, man, it just rubs you the wrong way. And so you, you're kind of going through life without any kind of joy because you're caught up in comparing yourself to other people. Maybe there's an unconfessed sin in your life that you haven't gotten honest with God about, something that you're, that you're trying to hide, and it's just eaten away at you. First off, go listen to last week's message about confession. But listen, David said that as he confessed his sin before the Lord, he prayed, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Maybe there's, there's some other reason um, in your life. Maybe it's unthankfulness, ungratefulness. Maybe you're lacking joy because your life is too busy. 
You get so busy, you get so caught up in, in doing, and you're always in a hurry. And when you're always in a hurry, you're living on edge. And when something doesn't go wrong, you just explode on it. Instead of responding appropriately, just because your life is too full of stuff. Listen, be honest about this question. What is it that is keeping you from living a joyful life? It's your responsibility as a follower of Christ to display joy, to have fun in the Lord. It's not a pass to go do whatever, but it's a joy that comes from knowing we've been forgiven and we've been saved. Second challenge I have for you this week is this. It's going to be a very easy one. This Wednesday, we're having, you've heard about it, Halloween hangouts. Six locations within two miles of Carver. If you need some fun in your life, you're like, I need to have fun. I need, I need some joy. Then go hang out with kids who are dressed up in costumes and give them candy. That's fun. <laughs> I need a hot dog with other people in your church and play some silly games and just have fun. Listen, the purpose of these hangouts is just simply for us to engage the people that are around us. We're not trying to like hook them and get them and things like that. We're we want to display the life-giving joy that we have in Jesus Christ. Listen, I want us to be a life-giving church. I don't, I don't want people to leave on Sundays and think, wow, what's going on there? Like, I want them to leave going, wow, what's going on there? Like, everyone's smiling and happy and excited and joyful. Listen, I don't want to paint this roses or red, you know, all the time, be happy and be fake about it. But through Christ... We have reason to be joyful. There's a season for everything. There's a time for laughing. There's a time for mourning. Someone said, we often um, don't take God seriously, but we take ourselves way too seriously. I find that to be true. We take ourselves way too seriously, and we don't take God seriously. What if we reversed that? What if we took God seriously, our relationship with God very seriously? but we took ourselves lightly. Listen, we're going to close and, and just kind of wrap up, and um, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and just kind of close your eyes. And um, again, we've, we've covered a lot. We've talked about a lot today. And so um, first off, if you're, if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, maybe, maybe you've just kind of, you've recognized today, God's kind of pricking at your heart. You're, you're just not living a joyful life. Remember, Jesus didn't die on the cross just so we could endure life. He died on the cross so that we could enjoy life. Would you just kind of, where you're at, would you just kind of pray a prayer of, of recommitment to the Lord today? Something like this, God, God, I'm tired of just enduring. God, I want to enjoy the life that you have for me. God, the life that you purchased for me. God, I have reason today to be thankful, to be, to be joyful because you are sitting on your throne. God, I have reason to be thankful today because I have been saved by your grace. God, I am loved and I am your child. And so I desire to align myself, recommit myself to you today and live this week with an abundant and overflowing, overwhelming joy. God, there's never been a time in my life where someone's asked, why are you happy all the time? God, forgive us of that. God, let your light shine through us this week in such a way that we would glorify you, that our lives would be pleasing to you, but God, even pleasing to ourselves as we align ourselves with your word. 